So, hello everyone, welcome back to the Japan Art Park. Art, art. We're doing good. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Japan Archives. I apologize for that. I've just got home from work and Heather has had a busy day with baby and our brains are failing us right now, but we want to record. We always want to record. We're still riding the wave of, I know I said enthusiasm. What's the word I'm looking for? I like enthusiasm. That sounds really nice. I mean, I'm definitely find what I did this week fascinating. I mean, I'd ask you how you are, but I think we might have to skip <laughs> that today. We're both a little tired right now, but it has been a lot of interesting things in the news, though, lately that I've been seeing that we need to talk about. I know we didn't make an episode on it when it came out. I've seen other Japanese podcasts do it, like the Se Seisho, the stone that broke with the demon inside. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I mean, it's, I do kind of want to do it next month, but I felt like doing a bonus episode on a female yokai was detrimental to the whole theme of Women's History Month. I didn't want to throw it in there. And it's about a supernatural woman when I want us to, when we want to do a month on actual real life women's history. Well, I mean, I, I, I thought it was interesting. I mean, I, I don't think that's a detrimental thing coming from the, woman side perspective but putting it in april also is delightful so i'm good with both that it's beautiful that you were you were putting so much thought and care I was like that's a that's a beautiful sentiment and i fully applaud it so no yeah and the the pearl diving women i've nearly finished the research it will be finished this week because i found a book i found a digital copy of it online from the 1960s which expands a lot more upon it than the initial research i found so Oh, nice. Learning more stuff, which is why we haven't finished it yet. But, you know, just got to read that last reference. But anyway, today's episode, like we said, we were going to do a story of a geisha. Our first introduction kind of into the geisha world. We're not really looking at specific aspects of what geisha wore or the things they learned. We would ju um, we're just going to look at the life of one geisha who wrote an outro biography. So, yeah, for this one, I have ended breaking ended up breaking it into part a and part b so i'm thinking maybe first week of april we will do one more episode on women's history because i wanted to do four different things for the month but this one turned out it worked better as two different episodes at least i think so the geisha today well her geisha name at least was mineko iwasaki she was actually one of the geisha interviewed for the memoirs of a geisha book i had oh. forgotten this and rereading the book I'm doing my research from, I haven't read it in 15 years, this book. And there's so many things I forgot, and it's fascinating to rediscover it again. So yeah, she was interviewed, actually, for Memoirs of a Geisha. Her original name was Masako Tanaka, and she's still alive. She's now 72 years of age. Uh, after the publication of the Memoirs of a Geisha, she decided that she wanted to create an autobiography to act as a contrast to the Memoirs of a Geisha. And when her book finally came out, she was 53 years old at the time. This woman has quite an impressive lineage, which I had completely forgotten about. And she's actually claims descent from the Fujiwara clan. The Fujiwara clan founded all the way back in 668 AD by Fujiwara no Kamatari. They themselves claim descent from the Shinto kami, the Shinto gods. So very impressive lineage. More specifically, she's descended from Fujiwara Tanaka, married Emperor Saga. So she is descended from an imperial prince. Together, Tanaka and Empress Saga, they had Prince Sumu, or some other references I find were called Sumeru. This prince was given the new family name because a lot of the time there was too many royal princes to claim succession. So they would give their children new family names and put them into their own new clans, which made them no longer viable for the line of succession. So this prince was given the name of Tanaka Minamoto, and it is from this family that Mineko's family is descended. In the Meiji era, so skipping all the way through history now, Mineko's great-grandfather had grown tired of the infighting of the aristocracy, and so he wanted to leave. The Emperor Meiji himself asked him to stay within the nobil nobility, but her great-grandfather declined. The Emperor, however, allowed them to keep their name, which normally isn't done because it was a aristocratic name they 
obviously were wanting to step away from it so it would become one of the normal people as she worded it in her autobiography but the emperor allowed them to keep the aristocratic name but now also the family does shorten it to merely Tanaka instead of Tanaka Minamoto so that is a little bit about her very impressive ancestry her story is going to start for us at the age of three and um, this is me you know making notes from her autobiography here so we we find her age three hiding in a cupboard while her parents talk to a woman known as Madame Oima. And we're going to keep that name throughout the story to just make it a little simpler. She was there at that moment to ask if Masako's sister, Tomiko, wished to become a geiko. And this term, Mineko says in her autobiography, it was more of a word that geisha would use for themselves. Geisha is hmm. a word we give to them. But for themselves, they normally call themselves geiko. Geisha means something along the lines of artist, whereas geiko meant something along the lines of woman of art. So they call oh. themselves Geiko. Madame Oima, seeing movement from the cupboard, she asks who was there. And so Masako meets Madame Oima for the first time. She says that, well, Madame Oima is apparently in awe of the child's beautiful hair, her black eyes, and her small red lips. And so Oima-san, the, o the owner at the time of the Iwasaki Okia in Gion, and Okia being a lodging or drinking house where Geisha and Maiko are affiliated during their careers, so pretty much where they live. She then announces that she's actually also searching for her successor to the Okia, and perhaps that she had just laid eyes on the person she wanted to be her successor. So she kind of saw this girl at age three, and she was thinking, you know, pretty beautiful girl i think she would be a good successor but anyway at that particular moment only age three her father said no but he would say but he did agree to ask if her other sister tomiko wanted to join and practice becoming a geisha in the future uh, at this point it should be said that he had already given up four of his other daughters due to financial straits and he didn't want to give away Masako. He didn't want to lose another daughter. In essence, they didn't tell Masako that Tomiko was going to leave and become a geisha. She says in her autobiography that one day Tomiko left for school, she went and she never returned and she didn't understand why. And She was very sad that her sister was no longer there. And Masako was saddened by this, but because I suppose she now had gotten Tomiko, she'd gotten one aspect of what she wanted, Madame Oima now turned all her attention to getting hold of Masako. And remember, she's only three at this point. She pursued the family for months, all the while her father declining to give her up. I mean, reading it out loud, it sounds so strange that this woman wants your three-year-old child. She's like, I want to take your child and make her my successor. I want to take her from your home, even though she's only three years old and doesn't, still doesn't really understand what the outside world is at this point. Yeah, how old is um, her sister? Did it say? I'm just wondering, like, he gave away all his other daughters, but not this one. But Tomiko, see ya. It seems kind of, I don't know. Well, I do know that Tomiko was at least, well, she was older. She was one of the older sisters. And she had also already visited the Okia a few times. Mm -hmm. So Madame Oima had seen that she had potential. Like, she'd been there. She'd done a little bit of spending time with other geisha and showing her personality and things like that. So... She could see that she had the making of a good geiko or a good geisha. But for Mine Mineko-chan, it was very, very different. Yeah, did Tamiko, I guess she wanted to go? She chose? I'm hoping she, she was allowed to choose. I think she did choose purely because her father said he would ask her. They weren't okay. going to force her very much okay, like good. they weren't forcing their other child, Masako, to go. It was like, no, you know maybe unconsciously, like, we can ask her when she's older kind of thing. Like, it doesn't feel like they were forcing them, but they also did give up other children in their past because they had very large family, and we will see later that some of these other daughters they gave away, uh, Masako never knew them. She didn't know they existed. They were gone before she, she was born. Getting more, well, I'm going to say more specific date. So in May, 
One day in May, Masako says that she remembers a woman coming to their home. A woman who scared her so much that she went and hid in her cupboard. And actually, throughout the book, it's interesting. Even when she grows up, when she has those emotions where she's scared or things have gone wrong, she still finds cupboards to hide in, even when she's grown up, which is fascinating to see that it was it was one of her comforts. It was like a place she could, I guess, hide, but also she could then use that space to think over what had happened and things like that. But we'll come to that later. So this woman comes along, scared her so much she hid in a cupboard. The woman came with two boys who were left at the house. This woman was screaming in hatred to Masako's parents at the time. And when she left, she left the two boys that she'd brought with them. The woman would return every month to give the boys candy. All the while, Masako hid in the cupboard every single time she visited until she left because she was such a scary woman, apparently. Later in time, her father said that he was going to go visit Madame Oima. And so he asked Masako if she wanted to come along. And she agreed. And it was there that Masako saw Tomiko again oh. for the first time because she just thought at this point she she left. She'd gone to school and never come back. Aww. And as it turned out, she had started her training at Madame Oima's house. And it was then that she also met another one of her sisters that she never knew existed. And this sister was called Kuniko. Masako was, of course, a little bit confused by all this. And to top it off, this angry, the angry woman who'd come to their house every month was this sister. So her sister had some children. So technically her nephews, Masako's nephews, and she had come to their house one day and left them with their grandparents. Whoa. I think later on we'll get into the reasons why she's so angry and bitter, but I can say now the reason she had to leave them with their parents is because in an okia, if a geiko has a child and it's a girl, they can stay because they have the potential to start their training. However, if they have children who were boys, they're not allowed to stay. It's the rule of the Okia. So because she had two boys, unfortunately, they had to go. They had to find somewhere else to live. And Kuniko decided, I'm going to ship them off to my grandparents. And they have no choice. Well, if, if it sounds like she was one of the, the daughters that was shipped off with possibly no choice. So I, Yeah, I can understand why she would kind of, well, if that is what happened, yeah. I can understand why she would feel like, you shipped me off with no choice, so... You know, look after your grandkids. You, I'm not giving you a choice. You know, I guess it's karma in a in a weird way at that point. So the whole ordeal in her autobiography, she does say it scared her and she cried on the journey back home. Moving on again later in time, Madame Oima comes again to visit her. And months later, her father takes her once more to the Gion district in Kyoto to meet with Mistress Oima. They hear of Tomiko's good progress. And this is where Masako meets another woman for the first time who is also called Masako. But in at that moment, our Masako decides to give the other woman a nickname due to her miserable character and sour face. And so she gains the nickname of Sourpuss. And that is the name we will call her in this story from now on. It's said that at this time, Masako went for a walk with her sister Tomiko and they went along with a lovely big dog, which she decided to call Big John. But after when she returned to her father and they headed home, it said that his father didn't seem like himself. Masako could sense something was different, something was wrong. And she overheard that night her parents saying that they could never let their daughter go. So it looks like maybe now the wheels are moving to get Masako adopted but into the Okia. Later, Masako decides to spend one night at the Okia in Gion. She writes in her autobiography that as a child, she thought in doing this, it would stop the angry lady from being mean to her parents, which is quite sweet. But of course, she wouldn't understand the truth for a long time. And so that night, she went to spend her first time there, taking her favorite pillow and her favorite blanket with her. 
It said that that first night, that when they all sat down for a meal, Masako reprimanded Sourpuss for beginning to eat before Madame Oima, as she was the highest ranking woman in the building. And not only did she start eating before her, she also started before anyone had actually said Itadakimasu. So Madame Oima kept telling everyone that they should listen to little Masako. So she was already treating her as her successor, basically saying to everyone, you should listen to her. What she wants to do will happen. And she also said that the other people in the building could only talk to her if she talked to them first. She was already placing her in a ridiculously high position of honor. And of course, Masako at the time didn't really understand why. She didn't realize she would in the end become a successor and she didn't realize what power that meant and these visits eventually they continued because Masako was enjoying her time there one day became two then it became staying a few nights a week and eventually a few months after turning five years old she moved into the building for good I and you I know you work with like five-year-olds or you have worked with five-year-olds and can you think of a five-year-old making that kind of a big decision for themselves mm. i was thinking oh maybe she's closer to you know teenage years no five years old and uh oh just to quickly i made an error earlier i got my names music kuniko is a sister of masako that she never knew existed so she met kuniko there for the first time but she also saw the angry woman there at the same time, who is actually her, like I said, she was another other other sister that she didn't know about. And she learns about this after she moves into the establishment. And this sister was called Yaiko. So yeah, two sisters, well, three sisters of hers in this Okia, two she never knew about, which, you know, I'm not surprised it was a big shock for her. Instantly, when she moves in, she's treated like the successor to the house people giving her great respect and after a few days clothes start being made for her they start taking her measurements madame oima did everything to make her happy and one day mineko was so startled by a revelation that she accused madame oima of being a liar and this is the moment she finds out that the angry woman was another sister she was called yeko and that she and that those children of hers were actually her nephews and to her, she just couldn't understand. She couldn't believe it. So she accused her, like, the mistress of the house of being a liar. So they work through that. They, you know, she slowly comes to an understanding about everything. And more time passes. And one day, Madame Oima announces that Masako is now going to be called Mineko. She's just changing her name. Okay. She's going to have her Geiko name. Masako refuses for a long time. She refuses to even listen to anyone when they use her new name. It's like, I can't hear you. You're not saying my correct name. I'm going to ignore you. And it became so bad that they actually called for her father to come visit. Her father, seeing she doesn't want this new name, he says to her, like, she can come home. She doesn't have to stay here anymore if it's not a change she wants to make. But once her father says that she can come home, she realizes that she want, kind of wants to stay at this point. So she agrees to allow people to change her name. So she agrees to be called Mineko from now on, which is what I will also call her from now. Mineko would begin her lessons to become a Maiko from now on. So on the 6th of June, after her fifth birthday, as her classes were drawing near to starting, it was said that it was time for someone to start acting as her older sister or more of a mentor for her. And it was decided to her disappointment that her angry sister, Yaiko, was going to take this role. And this was despite the woman in charge of this house saying that Yaiko had many more minuses than pluses to her name. Yet they still chose her to be Mineko's older sister. So we've now hit the 6th of June in 1954. And she was given her first lesson her first obligation, and it was to clean the lavatories of the Okia. It was the first thing, apparently, that is taught to someone who is going to be your successor. And after this, she would soon meet her teacher for the first time. On this day, she was dressed, apparently, quite beautifully in a practice kimono of red and green stripes against a white background with a red obi to finish it off. 
with that and her new silk bag holding inside a fan, a small towel, a snack, and a toy, she headed to meet her teacher, the Grand Mistress Yachio Inoue IV. Her first lesson with Inoue-san was how to learn to properly hold her Mayogi, which was the dancing fan the geisha used. In this lesson, she was reminded to say yes using the Gion pronunciation of hey instead of hai. Hmm. And soon after, she found herself dancing for the first time. And the first dance she was ever taught was called the Kadomatsu. After this, her lessons only continued to expand. She began having lessons in calligraphy, koto, singing lessons, and also in shamisen. And her, she had dance class every day. She had it every afternoon. Madame Oima slowly became more serious as as the work continued to teach Mineko to be her successor. And she would accompany now Madame Oima on her morning rounds, visiting the establishments her geiko had performed the night prior to thank them for their patronage, but also to start getting Mineko known in the wider Gion area. Her dancing continued. In fact, she writes in her autobiography, it was the favorite part of her day. And... Mistress Inoue, when she was happy with the dance he had learnt, she would immediately start teaching her a new one. And we see Mineko performing in front of people for the first time later in that summer. Now, unfortunately, she makes a mistake in the performance. Afterwards, blames all the other girls she performed with. Oh. It was it was only when Mistress Inoue said that she need not worry over the mistake she had made that it finally dawned on Mineko that she was the one in the wrong. She was the one who had made the mistake. And so the following day, she apologizes to the girls she, shout, she had shouted at, admitting the mistake that she had made. It was also a tradition at that time to thank Mistress Inoue the day after performing like thank you for letting me perform and all the japanese niceties and she again told mineko not to worry about the mistakes she had made but by this point mineko knew better mr zanoi was apparently the kind of woman who made you realize mistakes were not permissible by telling you not to worry about them that's what she writes in her autobiography i feel like i want to say something but I, i'm still trying to process that thought so if you did well what did she do I'm not sure what she said if you did well. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Hmm. hmm. I feel I, I, I'll, I'll ponder this. This is a ponder. This is a ponder. It's a ponder thing. Like, if someone said to me, oh, don't worry about it, I wouldn't necessarily immediately think, oh, she means I, I can't do it ever again. Mm-hmm. But apparently, that's the kind of woman she was. And yeah, don't worry about it meant please do not do that ever again. Yeah, I wonder how, how, what tone she said it in. Mm, I feel that the tone would have played a big part in it. Because mm. you can say don't worry about it in a nonchalant way. You can say it in a joking way. You can say it in a very serious way. And each time it can mean very different things. Mm. Mm, I do definitely wonder about the emotion she put behind it when she said it. Mm-hmm. The following year, she turns age six. And that's when school properly begins in for Japanese girls at this time. Obviously, she'd been having other lessons, but they weren't like actual school system learning. They were more like geiko learning. And she was shy. Apparently, she was so shy so much in school that teachers would actually play to her, play with her to try and get her to open up. And even Aww. the principal that sometimes got involved to try and break her out of her shell. She did make some friends eventually. One day after school, she went to the home of someone she was friends with at that point, a girl known as Hikari. But on her return home, Madame Oima forbid her from ever seeing this girl again. And this was Mineko's first look into prejudice at the time in Japan, because Hikari was from a group of people known as the Burakumin. Ah. People whose families were seen as unclean or polluted due to the jobs they had, such as butchers or undertakers. And it's actually said that soon after, Hikari no longer went to that school. And Mineko never found out why. Hmm. Aged eight, we see her go to family court for the first time to be officially adopted by Madame Oima. She would have to say that she wanted to be adopted in front of a judge. But at this moment, she was so scared by her decision because everyone was there, including her parents, that she threw up. (laughs) And the judge said that she would have to come back again when she was sure of the decision she wanted to make. And it would take a while for this 
to happen. We're going to jump again two more years. So by this point, she's 10 years old. And we return to family court. It's November 1959. And at this point, she said she wanted to be adopted. And so she said goodbye to her parents. That night, there was a big celebration for Madame Oima and her house. But for Mineko, she says it was a heartbreaking night for her. She took her ribbon. She took a ribbon from her hair and she says that she in fact tried to kill herself with it Aww. that night, but it didn't work. Aww. And so the next morning she hit the bruise on her neck and she went to school like normal. Oh my gosh. Her dancing that day because of the night before, she does say it was a bit of a disaster. When you go in, the teacher would say to you, what dance are you going to perform? And you would say the name. So the teacher knows the dance that is about to happen. So she says, I'm going to perform for you Cherry Blossoms at Night. And so she began. But not long after starting, the teacher demanded that she stop dancing. But there was a specific word that they used. A word that basically meant you need to stop. And you have to go home. You have to leave the school immediately. You have done such a bad job. You're done for the day. And that is what happened. Mineko went straight home. And she found a cupboard to hide in once more. Oh. In the end, it turned out that an assistant at the school had taught her that specific dance. But had given her the wrong name. She had mixed up two different names for two different dances. So Mineko thought it was correct. She was like, this dance is this name, but it wasn't. Unfortunately, it was a different name. Madame Oima and others, even the people at the school, feared the embarrassment it could cause. And they also feared that Mineko would now want to return home forever because she had been told to leave the school. You know, dancing, like she said, was the favorite part of her day. And she had been canceled that day. And so in the end, the next day, for both parties to save face, because obviously... Madame Oima didn't want the embarrassment of my successor made a mistake. The school didn't want the embarrassment of we taught her the wrong thing. Madame Oima and Mineko go to the school and they apologize to kind of, you know, put a nice band-aid on the whole situation. And then afterwards, Mineko then performs Cherry Blossoms at Night. And afterwards, cherry blossom viewing before a small gathering. So the two dances that were mixed up, she performs for them there and then. And one final thing I wanted to say, because this is kind of where I wanted to end it for this episode. Her, her adoption was finally completed on April 15th, 1960. This time there was sadly no fanfare. But one annoying thing now that she had adopted was that she wouldn't have to share a room with sourpuss oh. for me that was me condensing half the book oh into an episode of notes so it was kind of nice that halfway through her adoption is finalized so i felt it was a good place to pause for now i feel that we're we're getting close to a normal length episode anyway and if I'd have carried on, it would have been a super long episode, I feel, for us. So I feel like it made sense to break it there for now. Her adoption into the geisha world. We'll see a lot of changes now that it's become official and things. I could have condensed what I wrote for this episode down. But I felt like I didn't want to take anything out from here. I kind of liked all the extra bits I included just to give as more an idea of her character and actually what happened to her. And because if you think all of this from when she starts with the Okia, this all happens in five years. Yeah, there was a lot, a lot happening in just in five years. So she's a 10, no, five years, eight, eight, nine, ten. Wait. No, she, yeah, she was 10 she was... when she returned to the family court to be officially adopted. So her, her time from being in the let's see so she was three years old when she first met the madam and then five years old when she went in so five years after that so we have just a span of around eight years total that mm. you you talked about but a lot happened and just being so young too to oh it, it's 
and even like finding friends. But then, yeah, we've got something, another topic that we really need to talk mm. about at some we've, point. We've touched on the Buddha Kumi now a few mm -hmm. times in the past. So it keeps rearing its head and I want mm -hmm. to try and fully explore it, see mm -hmm. where it originated from, see... I feel like it also still happens today. I've read a few things where there are still communities that are associated be, with being Buddha Kumin and people don't want to associate with them still to this day, which is crazy and kind of bizarre. And maybe even touched an, a, on adoption as well, which is there's a lot about that too in Japan that we haven't talked about. And this is a different a different type of adoption that I, I was not aware of. I didn't realize that she would have had to, but I, I guess if she wouldn't be the successor of the, of um, Madam Oma to be her successor would have to have been adopted, which happens, I know, frequently with men who want to pass down their businesses to a son and don't have a son, they adopt yeah, them. Yeah, I heard about that. They, mm -hmm. you cannot pass on your business to someone if they're not in your family, which again is bizarre it's a weird mm. lore you shouldn't have to officially adopt this i mean full-grown man by that point <laughs> yeah there's and there's other things too like we we should mm. definitely touch back on adoption as well but i mean they, we've already getting into a few different things just from this few years and yeah you've definitely got bits of her personality coming through where she's seems to be a little bit more on the shyer side but also surprisingly confident in some mm, ways so definitely. it's a nice character nice character study for her age well i'm glad you found it interesting hmm I'm looking forward to the next part i mean i had forgotten so much about this story like i said i haven't picked this book up for 15 years it's just been following me around since <laughs> <laughs> waiting to be reread and told to a wider audience but yeah thank you for tuning in this week everyone there will sadly be no poem poet poetry corner from heather this week it's a two-part episode yeah heather is more <laughs> tired because it's very late and baby things so please forgive her for you know no, having one episode without a poem guys i think it's okay <laughs> it's a it's a two-part episode anyway so if we think about the poem as being at the end of the two-part episode it's just one long episode you'll get the poetry Can I set you end. a poem challenge oh, i know okay. we were doing the karuta but my challenge is, can you find a poem about a geisha? Okay, I can do that. So, hey, you know what? That, that instead of poetry at the end, you're giving me a poetry challenge. So it's still a poetry corner. Ha ha ha. Very good, Thomas. I like your, I like your idea. Very clever. And that concludes our poem corner for today, I suppose. <laughs> I'm setting Heather homework. Yay. I like, I like homework. I like stuff. Many stuff. Oh, gosh. Many stuff. Go to bed, Heather. It's time for us <laughs> to sign out. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the introduction to the life of Mineko. And, yeah, her life is only just starting. What? Well, she's only 10. Um, we're already halfway through the story. So there's a lot to cram in next week. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to relearning the story, if I'm honest. Thank you again for everyone tuning in this week. That is everything from me. How about you, Heather? That's all for now. Matane. Mina san, kyotsukete, matane.